Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Henrik Ibsen's play, The Wild Duck. Uh, so this is a very interesting play to read immediately after reading An Enemy of the People, which is how this Bantam Classics edition organizes the plays. So, I mean, it makes sense to follow, to, to have ghosts and then an enemy of the people because ghosts stirred up a lot of controversy and a lot of criticism of Ibsen. An enemy of the people was Ibsen's sort of response to this, where he basically says, I am on the frontier of truth and you small-minded people who don't see what I'm doing you are the decaying, declining remnants of failed truths. So that makes a lot of sense. In that play, though, in An Enemy of the People, Dr. Stockman's position seems to revolve around the idea that truth must be told at all costs. The truth is in itself an inherently good thing. In The Wild Duck, truth becomes much more problematic. And the idea of telling truth becomes much more fraught. So the play starts in the home of uh, old Mr. Whirl. Um, his son Gregors has come back temporarily uh, from their the uh, industrial operation in the north, uh, north of Norway, to this party also comes uh, a guy named Hjalmar. Uh, da, da, da. Hjalmar Ek uh, Hjalmar Ekdal. Uh, he is the son of a disgraced former partner of Mr. Whirl, uh, and now uh, Helmar is a photographer. So that's where we start. Um, Whirl and Gregors, the old Mr. Whirl is just called Whirl in the, the cast listing here. Um, so Whirl and his son Gregors get into a bit of a debate as it comes out that Whirl has helped Hjalmar and his wife Gina pretty significantly since the time that old Ekdal, Hjalmar's father, uh, was disgraced in a what seems like possibly a cover-up or even he was framed by Whirl, etc., etc. So we've got that initial sort of suspicion there. Gregors didn't know, but now learns that Hjalmar's wife, Gina, had been their former housekeeper, whom their, his dad was interested in pursuing a relationship with. So this heightens Gregors' suspicion of what's going on. And he basically comes to the conclusion that uh, Whirl has set up, basically stage, stage managed Hjalmar's life uh, in order to assuage his guilt about framing old Ekdal and in order to move on from his indiscretion with Gina. Gregors, even though we don't find this out overtly in Act 1, decides that he is going to open his friend's eyes to these truths so that uh, Helmar and Gina can form a better marriage, a more perfect marriage on a foundation of truth. And what he says to Whirl is, and there he is now, he being Helmar like a big unsuspecting child in the middle of all this deceit, living under the same roof with a woman like that, without the slightest idea that what he calls his home is built on a lie. So Gregors has this 
deep dedication to the truth. This is very much a sort of romantic, philosophical type position where he believes that the truth is important and cathartic and healing in and of itself. And he fails to consider that there may possibly be any sort of downside to telling the truth. Now, starting from Act 2 and into Acts 3, 4, and 5, we were basically in Hjalmar's home, which is also his photography studio. Uh, so we meet him, his wife, Gina. We actually meet him in Act 1, but we meet Gina. We meet uh, their child, Hedvig, their daughter, uh, Hedvig. And we get more from old Ekdal. And it's an interesting home life that they've built. Um, they have a bunch of animals in their attic, like rabbits and pigeons and a wild duck that was actually shot by uh, Old Whirl and then brought up from the, the bottom of the lake or ocean or whatever it was. They say ocean, but I don't know that ducks are really ocean-going creatures, but that, that's neither here nor there. Um, so they have this this home uh, with this like weird menagerie. Uh, we learn that Yalmar is working on a great invention that we don't really learn anything about it. And it's not entirely clear he has a particularly good idea of what it is or what it's going to do. Um, we learn that um, Hedvig really loves this wild duck. Like it is, it is her pet specifically. Um, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And the other important thing we learn about Hedvig is that she's going blind. Um, she's dangerously threatened with the loss of her sight, as Hjalmar puts it. Um, and and we learn that it's hereditary. Supposedly, um, Hjalmar's mother had also had difficulty with her eyes. Uh, we don't sort of know anything more about that, but we did have an indication in the first act that old um, that old Whirl has difficulty with his eyes and is possibly going blind. Ibsen is a master of foreshadowing. So, I mean, that element, the hints in Act 1 that Whirl is going blind, and then in Act 2 we learn that Hedvig is going blind, it is hereditary, etc., etc. This is foreshadowing a revelation yet to come that you, as a smart, clever, beautiful person, may have already figured out. But Kalmar also says another thing right here that's very much foreshadowing. He says, she suspects nothing, that is, Hedvig suspects nothing about her eventual blindness. She is as happy and careless as a bird, singing about the house, and so she is flitting through her life into the blackness that awaits her. So we've got the comparison to a bird. Interesting. The wild duck. Ooh. But we've also got this element of happiness, carelessness, and moving into inevitable tragedy which is what Kalmar is doing. Uh, he's very happy in his home life, even though Gina is sort of overbearing and, you know, it's built on this foundation of lies and whatever it is that Gregor is, is all upset about. But Kalmar is basically happy. He loves his wife. He loves his child. He's happy with his dad. He's gung-ho about working on this invention, etc., etc. So he's got a pretty good life. But Gregors can't leave it alone. He believes in the truth, again, as in itself an important liberating thing. And so in Act th at the end of Act Two, uh, in, or at the end of Act Three, rather, into Act Four, uh, Gregors takes Hjalmar out to talk to him. 
at which point he reveals the whole thing that Gina had had an affair with Whirl, etc., etc. Um, Hjalmar is predictably, if you know anything about human people and how they react to things, he is not stoked about this news. Um, Gina is not stoked about this being revealed either. Um, but Gregors doesn't seem to get that. Like, he seems completely oblivious to the fact that a reasonable human reaction to this news is not necessarily, great, I am unbothered and I love and forgive you. Like, there's a point here where Gina says, God forgive you, Mr. Whirl. That's Gregors. She calls him Mr. Whirl. And Gregor is greatly surprised, says, but I don't understand. Yalmar says, what don't you understand? Gregor says, after such a momentous enlightenment, an enlightenment that is to be the starting point of a completely new existence, a real, real, a real companionship founded on truth and purged of all falsehood. So he's got this, this idea that just having the truth out there is in itself going to be helpful but he seems to have no conception of actual human psychology and how people react to things. This becomes more apparent um, later on. When at the end of Act 4, so uh, Hjalmar determines he has to leave, uh, especially as he comes to recognize that there's a very good chance Hedvig is actually Whirl's daughter and not his. So, um, Hjalmar determines that he has to leave. He can, he can no longer live in this house. There's nothing to tie him, etc., etc. Gregors comes up with a new plan so that Hedvig can try and win back his paternal affections, which is that she is going to get old Ekdal to shoot the wild duck her most prized possession. She's going to sacrifice that to try and get her father to return his affection to her. It's a fucking ridiculous plan. Like, who would ever be like, oh, your dad, who's just found out that your mom had an affair that she married him to sort of get out of, and you're possibly not my daughter, He'll be, he'll be super thrilled if you shoot this duck that's your prized possession. Like, it doesn't make any sense at all. But Gregor's is just this, like, weird, like, philosophy student dropout. He, I don't think he's actually a philosophy student dropout, but he's like, he has this, like, attitude of, like, I've read Nietzsche, so I know everything about existence or something. And again, there's no indication here that he's read Nietzsche, but my point is, like, he's got that weird vibe of, like, I know what's going on and I know what I'm doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it just, it doesn't make really any sense. His plan is completely absurd. But, uh, Edvig's like, yeah, that nonsensical plan checks out. I'm gonna do that. We move into Act 5, and in the early... Uh, portion of Act 5. Uh, Helmar is still pretty pissed off at Gina. Uh, he's like, he's been out drinking with their sort of degenerate downstairs neighbors. Um, and he comes back and he, like, he's still officially in this I'm going to be leaving kind of phase. But as she starts like feeding him and like getting him coffee and you know, helping him collect up his stuff, he increasingly sort of loses steam. Basically, like, he, he, Gina manages, in effect, to remind him of how good it is to have a family and to have a wife who's willing to wait on him hand and foot, etc., etc. So, he loses steam. But, the ending of the play, I think, is very, very significant. Um, and, and this is another great example of Ibsen's 
skill at foreshadowing. Because earlier in the play, in Act 3, when we learn that old Ekdal has a hobby, because he, he used to be a great hunter. He used to go out in the woods before he was disgraced, hunt bears, etc., etc. Uh, so his hobby now is he shoots the rabbits that they keep in their attic, right? Uh, so the uh, the gun is introduced in Act Three. The first thing, as soon as I read the stage direction showing a double-barreled pistol. I immediately wrote in the margin, Chekhov's gun. Because another one of the great figures of modern drama, Anton Chekhov, had, uh, is, is famously associated with this rule that if you show a gun in Act 1, someone has to be shot with that gun in Act 5. Ibsen is doing the same kind of thing here, except in Act 3. So he has introduced a gun that largely then sits on a cabinet or a, a desk or something, a, a bookshelf, largely sits throughout the latter portion of Act 3, throughout Act 4, and then throughout at least part of Act 5. But we also get more foreshadowing than this, because Hjalmar tells Gregors about the role that this pistol has played in his family's life. Namely, that when his father, old Ekdal, was convicted of the crime that he, that he was convicted for, he had brought the pistol with him, intending to kill himself, but he did not. Then, when old Ekdal was in prison, um, Kalmar himself had intended to shoot himself with this gun and did not. We have two aborted suicides with this gun. Now, if you're clever, what you may be thinking is the rule of threes. Frequently in drama, in literature, um, things occur in threes because it's a nice, symmetrical, symbolic number. And so, if you are a clever reader who knows how these kinds of things work, or a clever viewer of plays and you're watching this, your suspicions are going to be piqued by a number of different threads coming together. And so at the end of the play, there is a shot that's heard. We know, uh, because we see uh, Hedvig take the gun, and go into the attic space where the wild duck is. So when the other characters hear the shot, Gregors assumes that old Ekdal has shot the wild duck on Hedvig's behalf, but then old Ekdal comes in and so they realize it wasn't him. So Gregors is like, ah, this is great. Uh, Hedvig has taken it upon herself to shoot the wild duck to win your affections back. Kalmar goes into the attic space where he finds that Hedvig has herself been shot. And the doctor, who's also kind of an alcoholic and maybe not a fantastic doctor, um, but he basically said, says, no one will ever persuade me that this was an accident. And so we have here a twist at the end. Gregors had encouraged Hedvig to sacrifice her most precious possession in order to win back the love of her father, and Hjalmar himself had, had basically disavowed his child. And so the play seems to end with Hedvig's suicide, whether that was a sacrifice of her most precious possession being her own life, whether that was her inability to bring herself to kill the wild duck, or whether that was genuine despair at her treatment by her father. We don't know. We simply don't get her motive. But we have the fulfillment of that rule of three. We have the fulfillment of the principle of Chekhov's gun. We have 
the fulfillment of these references to blundering blindly into tragedy. 